Good afternoon, everyone. We have a lot to get through today, including modeling, testing in schools. We're also going to hear from Dr. Rebecca Bell, the president of the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. First, last week I announced a new Vermont partnership with NIH and Amazon that will allow us to del deliver uh, rapid tests directly to the homes of Vermonters. Through this program, we've acquired about a half a million tests, which is about 250,000 kits. Uh, tomorrow, we'll launch the website so that Vermonters can go online and place their order. Households will be able to request no more than two kits, which is four tests, and we fully expect them to go quickly. As I said in the announcement last week, this is a pilot program we've been working on with our federal partners for about a month. Uh, this is also in addition to, not in place of, President Biden's initiative to send tests to Americans, which is expected to begin later this month. It's also in addition to the rapid tests that we've devoted to schools. As we also announced last week, child care programs will now be eligible to implement Test to Stay and can sign up and get their tests through the Department of Children and Families. Rapid tests continue to be an important tool, uh, especially given what we've learned about Omicron. While PCR tests are still beneficial, they take too long in many instances to prevent further spread due to the speed in which Omicron transmits. That's also why, based on the science and data, and in coordination with the Vermont's top pediatricians and infectious disease experts, the state is changing its guidance for dealing with COVID in schools. The process we've been using with school nurses acting as contact tracers was effective pre-Omicron, but it no longer is as effective as it once was. The new approach will get more tests out by treating everyone in a classroom where there's been a positive case as a contact, instead of how they previously defined close contacts. This means everyone in the class would be notified of a positive case and rapid tests would be distributed to those who have gotten them through test to stay. Now, I know uh, on social media, some, including a fellow, some fellow uh, politicians, claim we were reducing testing or doing away with it altogether. This is just not the case, and it's unfortunate they weighed in before having the facts. Again, the change will increase access to testing and increase notifications. As Dr. Levine will describe, Omicron makes this shift essential to supporting school operations and preventing further spread. Finally, as we see what's happening across the country and the Northeast, it's clear cases will continue to increase for a while. Although Vermont leads the nation in vaccinations, and as a result, we have one of the lowest hospitalization rates and death rates in the country right now, it's not enough. Please make sure uh, getting a booster is a top priority for you and your family. It's not too late. Anyone 12 and older is eligible. As we said for months, vaccination is the best way to protect yourself and others, but taking additional precautions is also important, like wearing a mask indoors staying home when sick, and using testing as a tool. With that, I'll turn it over to Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. On uh, Friday, we announced we'd be making a shift in our mitigation strategies for schools, uh, mainly changes to both contact tracing and testing. I thought I'd start off today uh, by explaining some of the background on that decision uh, and its announcement. There were two basic variables behind this decision, an evaluation of school operational capacity and public health considerations. From an operations perspective, uh, we've had some concern for some time about the ability of school staff to sustain uh, contact tracing. These concerns 
became more acute as we implemented test to stay since nurses are essentially the direct, uh, directly in charge of supervising both of those processes in schools. And I think as everyone's aware, Vermont was an early adopter in test to stay, uh, which proved to be a very successful strategy at the height of the Delta surge in containing uh, the virus, but also allowing a larger number of students to stay in school. But when we opened schools after the holiday, uh, unfortunately, at the beginning of the surge of the new Omicron variant, uh, it was clear we were going to have to make some adjustments, uh, both to contact tracing and testing, since Omicron was spreading so much faster. Um, in our processes of contact tracing and test to stay had difficulty keeping up. Last week, our decision making came to a pivotal moment uh, when our public health team uh, concluded that uh, contact tracing and surveillance testing were not going to be as effective against Omicron. We then factored in the operational strain of continuing what we were doing and concluded that we needed to make a shift. I outlined that shift for the first time uh, last week in my regular weekly call with superintendents on Thursday. And on Friday, I previewed our decision uh, with the leadership of all the major education associations, including the school board association, the superintendents association, the principals association, and Vermont NEA. Those conversations uh, led me to publish an advisory email to superintendents, independent school heads, and school district COVID-19 coordinators. Uh, late in the day on Friday, outlining the shift in policy and stating that more information would be coming out this week. I also met uh, with Vermont NEA leadership and its board of trustees on Saturday uh, morning. Uh, they had many questions about the public health rationale for these uh, changes, and I encouraged them to hold their public que health questions until this week when Dr. Levine and his team could be available to address them as they've done throughout the pandemic. I wanted to outline the decision-making and the communications on this since it has been characterized as abrupt. Um, and to a certain extent, I think that is a fair characterization. Omicron is forcing us to move quicker than we might otherwise have wanted. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, both from an operational perspective and a public health perspective, uh, we concluded we needed to make a shift and we needed to make that change sooner rather than later. My announcement on Friday could have contained, could, could have contained more specificity, uh, so I thought I would explain exactly uh, what the shift will mean for our schools and our communities, and also provide an update on some of the work we've been doing this week to enact that change. General description of the change is that contact tracing in schools as we knew it uh, will stop in favor of the, as the process the governor described of a response notification to parents uh, that includes recommendations for testing depending on the vaccination status of the students. The antigen testing in schools will shift uh, from what we used to call test to stay, where schools administered uh, the tests on site, to an approach where schools will distribute the antigen tests to families and staff for administration at home. Uh, both the response notification and the use of antigen testing uh, will be closely tied to our updated recommendations on quarantine and isolation. A key variable for implementing this new system will be testing supplies. Uh, schools will be receiving deliveries of additional test kits this week. Uh, so earlier today, uh, we put out an advisory to uh, superintendents and independent school heads and COVID coordinators uh, that they can transition to this new system when they feel they have an adequate supply of tests to do so, uh, which I expect for many schools will be later this week. Our next steps will be to update our guidance documents and related communications tools for schools, such as the letter templates they use to communicate notification of, of a case. Uh, that work is underway. Uh, we're working closely with the leadership of the School Nurses Association and other stakeholder groups uh, to develop those tools to maximize their utility to people that work in the schools. So uh, this is an important transition in our response to the pandemic. Uh, we've been through several other transitions in the past, so I'm confident we'll be successful. Uh, I do appreciate everyone's patience as we work through these uh, moments and the details of implementing the new system. Lastly, I wanted to speak to the issue of uh, school attendance waivers. These waivers pertain to the number of days each year uh, that schools are required to be in session for students. A session day uh, for a school is defined when a majority of its students are present for school instruction. Going remote does not count as a session day. This means schools are either open or closed. If they are closed more days than the minimum allows, they need to make the days up or get a waiver. 
The waiver process will begin later this month. The waiver process is outlined in our regulation and is designed to be implemented in the second half of the school year. The State Board has given me authority to review these waivers again this year. I'll be publishing an expedited waiver process soon for school closures that are related to COVID-19 conditions. I intend to be as flexible as possible with these waivers as I've done so in the last two years of the pandemic. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thanks, Secretary French. I'd like to start out by saying that I know what a difficult time this is. Probably the most disruptive month we will have endured. We're navigating yet another phase of this pandemic, seeing a surge of cases from a much more contagious variant. I've spoken many times up here about how unfortunately the virus is not going away but will eventually become endemic. Like other respiratory viruses, we'll have enough immunity that it can circulate without huge spikes in cases, hospitalizations, or deaths. We hope this difficult transition period will ultimately help us get to a time when we can live with this virus much more easily. As we've seen, been doing all along in the pandemic, we use data and science to make real-time adjustments in our approach. Omicron is no exception, and its pace makes it even more important to be nimble. And I understand how challenging this has been for our children. The virus has impacted their education, their sports, and play, and not any less the lives and jobs of their parents and that of their teachers and school staff. It is the defining characteristics of the Omicron variant that form the backdrop for why a change in our school guidance makes sense now. The variant's highly contagious, it has a shorter incubation period, and so spreads rapidly through the population. The good news is that it does seem to cause less severe outcomes, especially in our youth. That is why we're evolving our contact tracing for schools to be more expansive in who gets notified when there is a case so we can move faster to respond. And we're using rapid tests so we can move more quickly to isolate those who need to stay home and reduce the risk of further spread. Our North Star continues to be preserving in-person education for our youth, keeping kids who should be in school in school. We keep learning from this virus in real time building on our experience to date. That is why I'm here to present our updated approach, which builds on data and scientific rationale. And our pediatric colleagues are overwhelmingly in favor of this approach. The speed at which Omicron moves and spreads means that some of our current tools have been rendered less effective. We need to move faster to counter this variant. Our new strategies, are designed to be more effective, lessening the burden of work on school personnel. First, contact tracing will evolve from its currently rather slow and labor-intensive nature, somewhat outdated and outpaced by Omicron, to one that still accomplishes the essential task of notifying possible contacts. Once a positive case is identified in a class, all the students in that class are considered contacts. This is a more conservative approach that is faster and more comprehensive. Second, we are continuing the evolution to a more rapid testing system. PCR surveillance testing, while it may still be utilized by schools if they so desire, is too slow to respond to this new variant in the school setting. We believe PCR surveillance testing has lost much of its value. Moving to an antigen testing system at this time of high community transmission will be far more responsive. Schools will be able to distribute test kits to unvaccinated students so they can test daily for five consecutive days, and if negative, can stay in class. Test kits can also be provided to asymptomatic vaccinated students who do not need to quarantine 
but may want to test at day three, four, or five. Test kits can also be provided to vaccinated or unvaccinated staff, and even to students who are identified as close contacts outside of the school. By layering this science-based and simpler approach on all the other mitigation strategies being followed in our schools, like wearing masks indoors and staying home if you're sick, we can keep our schools as safe as possible and keep more children in in-person education, which is the core priority. I acknowledge we are shifting some of the responsibility to homes, but this will actually help parents and caregivers make decisions about illness and likelihood of COVID every day. Families deserve the certainty of knowing their child's status before they leave the house, not when their child gets to the school. And the schools, uh, the state's school nurses who have moved mountains day after day throughout the pandemic will then be able to be present for testing and evaluating students who become ill in the school. Beyond schools, I want to repeat and remind everyone about the quarantine and isolation guidelines because they're still rather new. The isolation period is the time following your positive test or when your symptoms began. Quarantine, on the other hand, follows your exposure to an infected person when you are a close contact, but may or may not become infected. If you have COVID, the isolation period is now five days, followed by five days of wearing a mask when around others, if you meet certain conditions. Either you never had symptoms, or your symptoms have improved and you feel better and you had no fever for the past 24 hours. We also strongly recommend having two negative antigen tests performed at least 24 hours apart, beginning no earlier than day four. And of course, remembering to notify your close contacts. You can get all this guidance at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 positive. Now for quarantine, certain people do not need to quarantine. You don't need to quarantine if you've had your booster shot, are fully vaccinated but not yet eligible for your booster shot, or you're fully vaccinated and enrolled in school. But you should wear a mask for 10 days and a test on day five is recommended. All others need to quarantine five days if they have no symptoms and will wear a mask for five more days. We recommend one negative PCR or LAMP test, which is a rapid PCR, on or after day five, or two negative antigen tests performed at least 24 hours apart, beginning no earlier than day four. For everyone, if you develop symptoms at any time, get tested, stay home, and away from others while you wait for your result. I'd like to thank everyone who's reported their at-home test results already. You can see on our case dashboard the high numbers of what we call probable cases, which is the category that these positive antigen tests fall into. If you've taken one of these tests, please visit healthvermont.gov slash report results so we can better understand COVID activity in this state right now. I also want to emphasize the importance of wearing a mask indoors. While any mask is better than no mask, we do recommend you wear a higher quality mask if you can find one as we face Omicron. Examples of high quality masks are N95 or KN95 masks, which are very good at blocking droplets. If you don't or can't get that type of mask, you can also layer a disposable surgical mask under a cloth mask to increase effectiveness. Just please don't rely on a single ply cloth mask. Finally, I want to continue making sure Vermonters are aware of available therapeutic treatments for COVID-19 because they are so critical to keeping higher risk people out of the hospital. But they need to be used early in the illness, certainly within the first five days. While the federal government tells us that supplies will be limited for several weeks more, some supplies are still available and are coming into the state. 
If you're at higher risk of severe COVID-19, it's important that you reach out to your healthcare provider as soon as you are positive to ask about therapeutic treatments. These include one monoclonal antibody requiring intravenous infusion, sotrovimab, and two oral medications. One of these, Paxlovid, has very high efficacy and has become the drug of choice. You can visit our web website, healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 treatment for more information. And keep in mind, these treatments are not needed for those who are not at high risk due to age or underlying illness. I'd like to now hand this over to Dr. Rebecca Bell. I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you all, so thanks for having me. As a warning, I did work last night, and so you will experience what my um, pediatric residents lovingly refer to as post-call Dr. Bell. So um, I, I want to just start by acknowledging that it has been a very challenging few weeks of the pandemic. With the arrival of Omicron variant in Vermont, COVID cases rose exponentially over the winter break, causing major disruption to schools and childcare last week. In the healthcare setting, we are feeling the strain of staffing shortages due to infected providers. In the setting of this recent stress and strain, I've been reflecting back to the beginning of the pandemic. Thinking back to March of 2020, when I remember driving to work at the hospital through completely empty streets, hearing about colleagues who had COVID and worrying about them. At the time, the modeling was predicting that we wouldn't have enough ventilators. We were worried about how we would care for patients. We were making plans with colleagues to figure out how to cover each other, not for if we got sick, but presumably for when we did. We were cleaning surfaces, but not wearing masks. There was so much we didn't know, and we were really scared. There was no community immunity, none at all. There was no infection-induced immunity. There was no vaccine-induced immunity. We were completely vulnerable. And we had to take extreme measures to keep people safe. And it was the right thing to do. Since that time, we've lost a lot and we've learned a lot. We now have vaccines that are incredibly effective at protecting us from severe disease. We have additional therapeutics. We know to wear masks. Things are different. They're still hard, but we are in a different place now. Despite all of this, we are all tired. In the healthcare setting, we have a staffing crisis. We desperately want our patients to protect themselves with vaccination. Despite more vaccinated folks getting infected and more children getting infected, still our sickest COVID patients in the hospital are adults who are unvaccinated. Caring for critically ill patients is hard and it's even more difficult when the illness could have been prevented. Schools are under a tremendous amount of strain right now as well. Throughout the pandemic, our schools have remained a place of relative safety with lower transmission rates than the community. And this is thanks to the incredible work of school nurses, educators, and administrators. COVID has put stress on all of our systems, but especially those settings that are under-supported and strained during non-pandemic times. Educators, child care providers, child health providers are all trying to manage the needs of children and families that generally keep us busy 100% of the time. On top of that, we have COVID. Many feel like this is their breaking point. The work done in schools to create line lists and to painstakingly contact trace, which we don't ask other settings to do, was really unsustainable during the Delta surge. And the changing epidemiology around Omicron has made it necessary to adapt our policies so that we can manage this virus without letting it break us. Vermont pediatricians have been working through the pandemic to consider how to mitigate the effects of COVID on children. 
We meet regularly with members of the health department and the agency of education. We appreciate the opportunity to provide input to these teams. We also meet regularly with the school, nurse, school nurses and the leadership of the Vermont State School Nurse Association. We are grateful for their work and value this collaboration. I'm here today to share pediatrician recommendations for both the K through 12 and childcare settings. These recommendations of note were discussed even prior to Omicron coming as we knew we're heading towards an endemic phase of this. We recommend that school nurses should continue to have the resources to provide on-site diagnostic testing to symptomatic students and staff with rapid antigen tests or lamp tests. They should continue to have the ability to provide take-home antigen or PCR testing to these symptomatic individuals. A note here, school nurses play an important role in public health, always, but much like myself, they are clinicians at heart. Pediatricians rely on the work our school nurse colleagues do. They are skilled clinicians and integral partners in child health teams. They have not been able to do the work they are trained to do and is so desperately needed during this time. They have been put in the role of what many refer to as the COVID enforcer. And this has strained relationships with families and led to school nurse burnout. With regards to other types of testing, such as asymptomatic screening or surveillance testing, testing after close contact, these types of testing should shift from the school setting to the home setting. Students and staff should have ready access to at-home rapid antigen tests, regardless of their vaccination status. And these tests could be used as a family sees fit. They could use them for asymptomatic screening if they'd like, for testing in symptomatic um, family members, for testing after a close contact, or for shortening isolation after COVID infection. We agree that given the shortened incubation period of Omicron, both PCR surveillance testing and that line list contact tracing are less impactful and, and truly not helpful and should be stopped in favor of these other types of testing. For the childcare setting, we recommend much the same, and we don't want to forget our children in this age group, their families, and the early childhood educators. We support the Test for Tots program where unvaccinated close contacts are provided at home antigen tests so that they may remain in the childcare setting if they are asymptomatic and negative. We recommend additional access to at home rapid antigen testing for children and childcare staff for the same indications as the K through 12 community. I will note that one major challenge is that take home antigen tests are not authorized for individuals under the age of two. Um, and that's a challenge that we need to work through. We continue to strongly advocate for universal masking regardless of vaccine rate or vaccination status. And speaking of vaccines, we strongly encourage all eligible to be vaccinated. Vermont has the highest rate of five to 11 year olds vaccinated in the country, and yet it's only just over half of folks in that age group. Please reach out to your child's medical provider to discuss you can also check out AEP Vermont's website. We did a series of virtual town halls with families and they're all recorded and on our website at aapvt.org. I wanna take a moment to, to talk to families with children too young to be vaccinated. I feel you, I'm a mother of a child in that age group who is in full-time childcare. This is an age group that frequently gets ill from respiratory viruses. What we are seeing in Vermont in this age group are COVID presentations very similar to other viruses. So when families ask what they should be looking for if their child is infected with COVID, it's very similar as other respiratory viruses. Most children do not need medical care, but please contact your child's medical provider if you're worried, if they're having difficulty breathing, or if they're unable to take adequate fluids as you would normally. I don't wanna lose sight of the fact that staying home when sick is incredibly important. I know it's hard. It leads to school absences, missed work, and childcare challenges. But this is what helps keep our communities healthy. 
If you are sick now, you are likely infected with COVID. Even if you, but even if you don't have COVID, you have something. And that virus could make someone very sick. We admit children to the pediatric intensive care unit all the time who are critically ill from respiratory viruses, non-COVID respiratory viruses that cause the common cold in most, but can make infants and medically <coughs> complex children extremely sick. So as a reminder, all those above six months of age are able to get a flu shot. Please do, it's not too late, and please stay home when sick. As a final note, pediatricians and family medicine providers are very busy right now with COVID, with other respiratory viruses, and with the ongoing youth mental health crisis, as well as staffing shortages. It may take longer than usual to see a provider for non-urgent issues like sports clearance. We understand the frustration and we're working hard to get your children in. We appreciate your patience as we navigate this all together. Pediatricians always value collaboration with schools and childcare. Thank you all so much for the work you do for children and families in Vermont. Good afternoon. I'm Jenny Samuelson, the Interim Secretary of the Agency of Human Services. Today, I'll pro provide you a brief update on COVID-19 vaccines, testing, and hospital readiness. As of today, over 50% of Vermonters age 18 and older are fully vaccinated and have received a booster shot. For children in the age range 5 to 11, 48% are now fully vaccinated and up to date. Turning specifically to boosters, over the past week, boosters have been opened up to children aged 12 to 16. As has been stated several times, for anyone 12 years and older, getting your booster provides you the best protection against a severe case of COVID-19. If you are 12 years and older, and it's been at least five months, which is a change, since your completed Pfizer or Moderna series, or two months since your Johnson & Johnson shot, you are now eligible for a booster. We continue to look for opportunities to make it easier for every Vermonter to get vaccinated and boosted. We've expanded the number of clinics in schools. By the end of February, more than 80 school clinics will have been offered in 2022 alone. In addition, we're providing both vaccines and boosters at as many as 30 winter events happening across the state. We continue to look for additional opportunities. If you are a business, a civic group, or a community organization and would like to host a clinic, please reach out to us. We will, we will come to you. Our goal is to make it easier than ever to get vaccinated. You can re request a vaccine booster clinic by signing up online or going to healthvermont.gov and clicking on your community. So whether you're looking to get vaccinated, get a booster, or just get tested, please visit healthvermont.gov or you can call 855-722-7878. Now, let's turn to testing for our youngest children. As others have mentioned, last week we rolled out Test for Tots. Test for Tots extends the Test to Stay program, which is already offered in K-12 schools, to students who are two to five who enrolled in a child care program. If all uh, it allows children and staff who are close contacts to continue to attend their child care program during their quarantine period, as long as they test daily and their test results are negative. Under the Tets for Tots program, rapid antigen test kits are being provided to regulated child care programs. When there is a positive case in an enrolled child care programs, family and children who have been identified as a contact will be able to test their child at home during their quarantine period. With a negative test, that child will continue to be able to attend their child care program that day. At this point, more than 470 Vermont child care programs have already signed up 
to take part in the Test to Tots program. To participate in Test for Tots, child care programs can register online through the Department of Children and Families website. Roughly 12,000 tests are going out to child care providers this week, and we are also distributing nearly 50,000 masks to these programs. Meanwhile, we continue to offer testing for the general public. For the general public, significant testing options are available statewide through the ongoing PCR program as we transition to a more rapid system. We currently have PCR testing locations at 30 sites across the state. In the next week, there are a total of 25,000 testing appointments. Of those, nearly 14,000 are still open for registration. Additional sites and appointments may be added throughout the weeks in areas where there are low testing opportunities. Again, as more rapid test take-home tests become available, we'll get as many of them out to Vermonters as possible and as fast as possible through programs like the Amazon program the governor mentioned. Vermonters have done their part in so many times during the pandemic. We're once again, as we enter into this new phase, asking them to do their part. We want to be clear about when it makes sense to get tested in the current environment. Please get a test if you're symptomatic, you're a close contact, you tested positive and are in isolation and would like to end isolation, and lastly, get tested if you plan to visit someone who is vulnerable. Now for testing perform performance. In the past week, we experienced a delay in our PCR testing um, reports result system. Over the weekend, we became aware of a significant delay in reporting test results from the public testing sites. This delay caused by a technical glitch in our reporting platform resulted in up to a four or five day delay in reporting for roughly 8,200 test results to people in Vermont. These tests were done on January 6th and January 7th. First off, I wanna apologize for the frustration this has caused Vermonters. We have resolved this issue. We expect the remaining people who have experiencing these delays will have their test results by the end of the day. Test turnaround times are now back to the usual two to three days for PCR tests. In addition, because of the glitch, 40,000 lab results were delayed in being reported to the Department of Health between January 7th and January 10th. Of those, approximately 4,375 additional positives were identified. Our data team is working to assign those cases to the dates that they should have been reported. When this work is completed, the public dashboard will be updated. We anticipate the testing dashboard will be updated um, and the numbers will be adjusted on Wednesday. Now, turning to hospitals. We are monitoring hospital capacity very closely. We continue to support hospitals with, with staff through a staffing contract with TLC and FEMA staff in hospitals across the state. To keep hospital beds open for those who need them the most, we can continue to work to ensure that there are enough subacute beds to move patients out of hospitals when appropriate. We have opened 127 additional beds and facilities across the state. There are currently 91 beds open, staffed, and ready for admissions. We also continue to work with TLC to expand the pool of staffing available for hospitals and long-term care facilities when they're in need. As all data shows, the best thing that you can do to ensure hospitalizations are kept under control is to get vaccinated and get boosted. Finally, following the information you just heard, on the impact of COVID-19 in Vermont, in the nation right now, I wanna take this moment to emphasize the importance of every Vermonter having health insurance. Vermonters can enroll in health insurance through Vermont Health Insurance Marketplace, Vermont Health Connect, through January 15th for coverage that begins on February 1st. Our Customer Support Center is offering expanded hours this week. Please visit vermonthealthconnect.gov to see the health and dental plans that are available and to see the lower cost for health insurance through the state's marketplace. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek.
Uh, before turning to the modeling presentation, just to um, pick up where Secretary Samuelson left off, uh, when it comes to insurance, uh, the federal government last night announced coverage for at-home rapid tests for all of those on commercial coverage. So Vermont issued a rule um, about four weeks ago uh, that applied to all of the plans that we had jurisdiction over. We estimate about 140,000 Vermonters. Uh, this new rule will now apply to all of those who have commercial insurance beyond those which uh, we have jurisdiction over, an estimated over another 200,000 or so Vermonters, you know, bringing about 320 to 340,000 Vermonters now eligible for reimbursement through at-home tests. The rule is very similar to ours. Um, it is a reimbursement mechanism, although the federal government is encouraging plans and issuers to have a no-cost upfront option at pharmacies. Uh, our pharmacy option is now fully implemented. Uh, so you can get reimbursed. It's just a matter of how will that work uh, with your particular insurance company uh, and whether they're set up with a pharmacy. So I do encourage Vermonters to check in with their insurance company before going to the pharmacy to ensure that they are online and ready to handle those claims. Uh, but this certainly will uh, make a more uniform approach uh, to at-home testing coverage and just another uh, option for Vermonters seeking those important tests. So turning this week uh, to the data, uh, first again to leave up, pick up where uh, Secretary Samuelson left off, uh, we'll have a full uh, slide updated uh, as of probably tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon uh, that we will post on the website that has all of the data that we usually include. Uh, so this is a little bit of an abbreviated slide deck uh, because we don't have all of the granular detail uh, that we normally would have uh, for Tuesday presentation. But starting off on the data that we do have, you can see that uh, for this week, Vermont's cases did continue to increase. You can see that they're up about 70% over the last seven days, about 245% over the last 14 days. And visually, you can just see the impact that Omicron has had in Vermont. Uh, we're under the Delta surge. The cases were increasing, but increasing at a pretty modest pace through November and December. And then that much more dramatic increase that we're seeing here in Vermont, the rest of the uh, region in New England and the country uh, over the last two weeks. Taking New England as a region, uh, there were about 380,000 reported cases uh, in New England this week. If you take the estimates that uh, infectious disease experts are using, that for every reported case we have, we have about four or five cases that are not reported uh, due to the transmissibility and the more mild symptoms that come with Omicron. That is an estimated 10% of the New England population that has had COVID-19 over the last 10 days based on those numbers. So this gives you a sense of the prevalence of the virus at this moment. And it also gives you a sense of why uh, there's an expectation that this will start to come down at some point uh, into the future, likely the end of January or February for the country, uh, because so many people are being impacted uh, at one time. Uh, looking at the next slide, another reason, obviously, why the cases are spreading as quickly as they are is the continued uh, development of Omicron uh, across the country and in the region. The CDC now estimates that 96% of all cases in New England uh, are Omicron. Uh, that's up from in the low 80s last week. So now clearly not just the dominant variant, but basically uh, the only variant that is circulating within the region. And then when we look at that impact that Omicron is having across the country and compare some of the metro areas to the non-metro areas, you can see that uh, the metro areas continue to be higher. Uh, they continue to have more disease prevalence. And throughout the entire pandemic, these two measurements have moved at different times with each other, but they've always caught up uh, over time. So we do continue to expect those more suburban and rural areas, much of northern New England, for example, in Vermont, uh, to continue to experience uh, more significant case growth uh, as Omicron continues to spread uh, through these more rural areas. And you can see that happening here this week with the, uh, the non-metro counties up about 125% compared to the 80% for the metro counties. And looking at the next slide, you can see the uh, nursing home uh, outbreaks, the active outbreaks did increase this week. We have 10 active outbreaks up from just three last week. Uh, so no outbreak that's particularly large at the moment. Uh, our booster uh, uptake is really strong relative to the rest of the country in our nursing homes. So that is certainly encouraging, but we we'll want to obviously keep a close eye on that um, over the next couple of weeks. Now turning to one of the forecasts, the ensemble forecast for the country. Uh, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier how sort of prevalent this virus has been in the last 10 days uh, in New England. The same is true for much of the rest of the country. 
you can see that the forecast that the uh, ensemble modelers uh, put out last night shows that cases are expected to continue to increase through the end of January, getting to over a million cases reported a day. But then the good news is that some point there toward the beginning of February, the end of January, there's the possibility that they will start to slow down and come down across the country. Now, of course, want to note that that won't necessarily happen uniformly across the country. Some places have had Omicron uh, earlier than others. Some places have different profiles in terms of demographics or vaccination status. Uh, but that certainly is some encouraging news in terms of what the prediction is uh, once we get through the worst of it over the next three to four weeks. And the Vermont model is uh, very similar to the national model, showing again that cases are expected to get higher through the next three or four weeks. But then at the end of January, toward the beginning of February, uh, showing some slowing signs there uh, as um, the impact uh, will have been felt uh, at that point. So when we get to the next slide, we'll look at hospitalizations. And you can see that on the hospitalization front, overall hospitalizations, the seven-day average did surpass the uh, height of the Delta peak. So these are the most hospitalizations on a seven-day average that we have uh, experienced over the last week. That's a 34% increase. The majority of patients still among the unvaccinated. Uh, today's number is 64%. Over the last seven days, 55%. So that's the overall hospitalization number. But again, one point of good news in our data is looking at our ICU numbers. When you look at, at that case, uh, the ICUs have remained flat this week. There has been no increase in our ICU numbers. Um, over the last seven days, about 63% of those in the ICU are among the unvaccinated. For today, that number is 80%. Uh, so again, continues to be those unvaccinated in the hospital, particularly those needing the most critical care. Uh, and that's what our data is clearly showing and continuing to show. Also, jurisdictions that have had really high booster uptake have seemed to be able to keep the most uh, severe illness, like ICUs and deaths, under control, even though cases have spread as rapidly as they have. So Vermont being one of the highest boosted states in the country, that's something hopefully that will uh, mean good news for us here in our state. We're about 14 days out from cases rising as dramatically as they have. That's when other jurisdictions started to see their ICUs be impacted. So I want to keep a close eye on that over the next uh, week to two weeks. But at the moment, uh, good news in terms of the severity of illness that Vermonters are experiencing. And again, largely attributable to the high booster uptake that we're seeing in Vermont. Looking at the availability slide, so you know the increase in hospitalizations and other staffing uh, shortages and other issues that hospitals are facing has impacted the availability over the last two weeks. You can see on the hospital side, those coming down, uh, 58 beds available as of today. It's impacted the ICU side as well, although not as much as you can see. And there are 11 ICU beds available statewide uh, as of today. On the fatality slide, you can see that there are seven fatalities for the month of January recorded so far for this month and new year. Brings the total to 487 fatalities uh, for the entire pandemic. Vermont continues to be the lowest per capita in terms of the number of deaths throughout the entire pandemic. Um, so again, something for us to, um, to appreciate. Again, largely attributable to Vermonters doing all of the things that we've been asking them, masking, testing, getting vaccinated, and getting boosted. So another fatality slide, uh, looking at the uh, differences between those that are fully vaccinated and boosted compared to those who are not fully vaccinated over the last six weeks. You can see that this has held really steady. Uh, we've been showing this now for four or five weeks. That difference is 24 times. So 24 times more likely to die from COVID-19 if you are not fully vaccinated compared to somebody who is fully vaccinated and boosted. And that data has been pretty clear through the Delta wave and into the Omicron wave as well. And again, you can see here why uh, that difference is so stark and why we're able to keep our most severe illness uh, under control at the moment is because of how high our booster uptake has been. We've added another 11,500 Vermonters to our booster ranks in the past week, which is great. You can see where we stand in terms of uh, the percentage of our population having a booster shot. But there's still about 200,000 Vermonters who are eligible for a booster shot who have not yet gotten it. So that is really a critical step uh, for those that have gotten your full dosage to go and get the booster shot to get the full protection. And then finally, just an update on the 5 to 11 uh, vaccination status. 
You can see we continue to make progress there at 58.6% in terms of uh, those 5 to 11 that have started vaccination and 47.4% uh, in terms of those who are now fully vaccinated. So again, nation leading, we'd like to see that higher, of course, and certainly encourage parents to take advantage of that uh, as a means of keeping schools open and kids in school as well. So with that, I'll now turn it back over to the governor for questions. Thank you, Commissioner Pichak. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor, some questions about the uh, NIH and Amazon uh, project. I happened to notice on the test kit that I have at my home that it says it's supposed to be stored between 35.6 degrees and 86 degrees. Of course, Vermont is far from having temperatures of 35.6 degrees. Any concerns then about a project that would be sending test kits into mailboxes at this time of year or on front porches where it's quite cold? Um, I may refer to Dr. Levine uh, with this. I, uh, I wasn't aware of that, but Dr. Levine may have an answer. Yeah, we've reached out to uh, the companies actually about this and the FDA, and apparently there is a concern about temperature for prolonged periods of time. We're trying to get a better handle on what that means exactly prolonged and how much work they have done to understand it. Um, they've tried to give us an indication that this is not something we should be overly concerned about, but you're not the first that's asked, and that's why we're pursuing that pathway. And how will this program be uh, advertised to Vermont? When's the link going to be coming out? What's the channel going to be, et cetera? Um, yeah, I, as I said in my remarks, uh, it'll start, it'll open up tomorrow. Um, so the, you'll be able to sign up um, to get your tests, and uh, then they'll be shipped. Secretary Samuelson. The link will be available tomorrow at approximately 10 a.m. Um, in order for folks to begin to start to order. And where should people look for that link? Um, there'll be a link, an available link from the Department of Health's website. That there's going to be, um, as we enter this next stage of the pandemic here, there's going to be more responsibility on families uh, to, to step up and help mitigate the virus with um, students. What, what happens if a, a parent just decides to not test their, their, their kid because they maybe can't take time off of work? They send their kid to school uh, without a test. What happens then? Yeah, I mean, these are some of the risks uh, that we're taking uh, on a regular basis. This is like going from pandemic to endemic, um, because we, in the past, when we've had the flu and cold and so forth, uh, this is something that we experience. So uh, going back to some form of self-responsibility is important, um, but we certainly want to advocate. We want to be able to have the tests available uh, for those who are willing to test their, their kids. Um, but, um, but it seems to be the most effective uh, tool we have and uh, the most effective way uh, to, to do this as well. And so I would probably ask Dr. Bell if she might want to comment. Well, I think um, it's important to remember that the, the school setting in particular has been a more controlled and rigid place for this type of thing. And so um, we've been able to keep school transmission low compared to the community because we have no control about what happens in the community. And so I know there are folks who are concerned about, um, about families maybe not following guidelines, but that is already happening. And so um, what we know about are close contacts that happen in school. We have no idea what kind of close contacts are happening outside of the school. Um, and what we've always been relying on this entire pandemic is that that we're all as a community honest with each other, right? So, um, so yes, there may be students who are unvaccinated in the school, who are told they have a close contact, and um, and they don't test. But there are also students who um, have lots of contact outside of the school. They're exposed, and it takes many layers for them to even know. So they need to be informed by their friend or family member or contact that they even were a close contact. And then they would have to then 
find a way to test themselves. So um, there's, a, there's obviously, a, for good reason, a lot of focus on the schools, but we forget about all the stuff that's happening in the community that we don't know about. And I think, again, encouraging folks to be honest and transparent about symptoms, whatever they are. You know, I have symptoms today, let's, let's, not, let's not do that thing we were planning to do. I think that kind of, that's what we're trying to encourage. And in speaking with schools um, and, and childcare programs, I mean, one of the biggest strains this pandemic has been on relationships and on trust. And people worried about what other folks are doing and how that might affect them. And we're at a place right now where we have a lot of people vaccinated. We have great vaccines. And trying to, I encourage folks to try to refocus energy on themselves and what they can do um, and, and try to repair relationships and trust. I think that's a hard, it's been a hard thing for school nurses. It's been a hard thing for, um, for families and, and educators. So that's what I would encourage. And then I know Commissioner Pichek is a member of that task force as well, if you wanted to weigh in. Um, I, um, I learned about it, like most Vermonters, and, and read about it and heard about it uh, in, through the media. Um, but I think it's encouraging, uh, good news, that we're seeing some forward progress. Uh, the, the devil is always in the details, and I uh, haven't seen any of the details yet. Um, my concerns are, are still the same. Uh, that we have something that's viable, um, that uh, uh, that we can, uh, uh, that's sustainable in the future, um, regardless of whether we have all this federal money or not, that we have to make sure that we're we're doing this and making those structural changes, uh, so that we can have it sustainable for the future. So I look forward to hearing all the details. It has a long ways to go. Um, this is a conceptual deal uh, that uh, leadership it appears and uh, a committee uh, of some representation um, has um, maybe agreed to, uh, but now has to be put in bill form and then go through the uh, committee process, through the Senate, through the House, and then um, if uh, everything is uh, tied together uh, and passed, then it comes to me for signature. So again, this has a long ways to go, but. But I wanted to reiterate that I'm encouraged to see that there's some progress because it's uh, it's essential because it's 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 uh, it's a billion it's a billion dollar problem we have on our hands and we need to uh, to take some action. Would you support the, 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 there, there is about two hundred million dollars in, in one time funds put towards uh, pensions right now? Would would you support that that concept of uh, putting that much money toward it? Right now? Um, you know, again, we'll have to see the details uh, of that. I'm not interested in just throwing hundreds of millions of dollars in anything uh, if it's not sustainable and it doesn't fix the structural problems. So, uh, again, it depends. And uh, and I don't know what the figure is. I, I hadn't heard, uh, I'd heard uh, 100 million plus, but maybe it's 200 million. I just don't know at this point. We. There was money uh, that set aside, 100 million set aside for this, um, so it's in with a, within the realm of possibility. But we obviously, I'll be coming out with my budget next week. Um, suffice it to say, I didn't know about this, so I haven't included that. Um, so there'll have to be decisions made about what we'll do without uh, at that point in time, because it has to come from somewhere. Commissioner Pichet. Yeah, thank you very much, Governor, and uh, thank you, Devin. So, yeah, I think to reiterate the Governor's point, it's an encouraging sign. You know, everybody that showed up to the task force willing to, uh, you know, roll up their sleeves, come up with the best ideas that they could to try to make the uh, pensions and the health care uh, side of the equation sustainable. So, uh, you know, obviously teachers and state employees and staff have been through a lot during the pandemic. This conversation has been uh, certainly another uh, thing weighing on them. It will be good to get the conversation and the action, you know, complete and over with. There's a lot of a lot of ways to go, as the governor said. You know, the legislature, I think, needs to take a good look at the proposal, uh, look at the financials, uh, make sure that um, it makes sense to them, do more due diligence. Uh, we were about six weeks late on giving the report, and we really just needed to get this proposal to the legislature for its consideration, um, you know, and that, I think, is what we did yesterday. So um, there's things in there that, again, 
I think, move the ball forward. Uh, there's, uh, you know, contribution increases that the unions have agreed to. So that certainly is, um, you know, something to uh, point to and, and, and a sacrifice that is being made on that hand. But you need to look at the whole picture, as the governor said, look at what the impact is um, on the pension side, what the impact is on the health care side, uh, and then where does the money come to fund that? And those are some of the critical questions that still have to be developed. about um, fake testing sites pop up around the nation. I wanted to know if that was a concern here. Um, um, maybe you could tell, I, I, didn't, I don't know if I, the testing sites? Fake, uh, like fake testing sites, um, scams, um, COVID scams, people thinking it's a testing site, but then getting scammed. Um, oh, I, I had not it. heard of that. I don't believe it's happening in Vermont, but I may ask uh, others to weigh in if they've heard anything. Uh, nothing that we've heard of uh, thus far, but uh, obviously we'll be keeping an eye out for that uh, to be sure that people are getting what they need. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to uh, not only have all the testing sites that we have available uh, throughout the state with PCR uh, tests um, but, um, um, and lab tests, but, um, but also the antigen tests that we're trying to distribute directly to them. Uh, so that they can test themselves. So we'll continue to keep an eye out for that, though. Can you just a follow-up question? Um, at this point in time, does fully vaccinated also mean boosted? Yeah. Uh, I think that is a, an ongoing conversation, and I'll probably ask uh, either Dr. Gelso or uh, Dr. Levine uh, talk about this further. Um, but, um, but I think if we could go back, uh, I don't know as we would have uh, used the, the term fully vaccinated in the beginning uh, because it's really about keeping current, right? You, we want to make sure that you're having all the, the, the vaccines, the third dose, the booster dose, uh, uh, everything you possibly can to keep up. Uh, so that would mean um, literally fully vaccinated. But that term has been fully vaccinated was uh, two doses of uh, Moderna, two doses of Pfizer, one dose of of J&J, &J, and uh, that's just not the case at this point. But I would say that they're struggling with trying to transition to what that means for everyone. Thank you, Governor. And I think from a individual person standpoint, I prefer that people think about what qualifies them to be fully protected and up to date on their vaccine. Those are the terms that have more meaning to an individual, fully protected and up to date. And clearly in Omicron, if you want to be fully protected and up to date, and the time has passed for when you could get a booster and you haven't gotten a booster, you're not fully protected and up to date until you get your booster. CDC has not formally changed the definition uh, at this point in time. The projected case slide, it looks like over the next few weeks we could, the state could expect a seven day increase between 3,000 and 5,000 cases based on that innermost confidence ban, which would be totally a record for here in Vermont. I, yes, the slide here. What is the concern there that, I mean, that could close schools, people out of work? We, I mean, I know we're in this surge, but yeah. that would be a incredible increase in again cases. that is a concern uh, I'm concerned about the labor force and how what the effect will be especially on health care workers and essential services uh, that that is one concern um, but our main concern throughout has been hospitalizations and deaths uh, so we'll continue to watch that metric uh, and be sure that we're managing that so far so good in that regard um, but um, but we'll do we're taking all kinds of precautions, taking steps to be sure that we can provide the care that people need uh, in, the, in the event that they uh, become ill, some uh, not with COVID, by the way. I mean, when we watch the hospitalizations, um, it's interesting uh, because we saw, I think uh, most of you have seen that uh, New York, for instance, has, uh, has given us uh, data that, that says that 37% of those who are in the hospital um, are in um, not for COVID, um, but have COVID uh, while they're there. So we're, uh, we're trying to gather uh, some information on that to see where we stand. But regardless, uh, once they're in the hospital and they have COVID, it is a higher level of, 
of trying to segregate and so forth and protect everyone else. So it does impact uh, healthcare and the hospitals. Uh, but, um, but again, my concern is making sure that we uh, provide for those essential services uh, that w we need to get through this hump, so to speak. Dr. Bell, um, Dr. Levine, anything you want to add to that? Uh, just one sentence again. Lots of people are going to get Omicron. Um, many are talking now in terms of uh, not if, but when. Um, it doesn't mean, though, you're going to become deathly ill. And I want everyone to pay a lot of attention to, Dr. P to Commissioner Pichak's slide regarding the risk to those who are unvaccinated versus those who are vaccinated and boosted. Uh, you have very, very, very slim chance of being hospitalized or having a severe outcome, uh, even if you have a reasonable chance of getting Omicron if you've been vaccinated and boosted. So I think that's really important uh, for everyone to pay attention to. The other part of that is that, um, yes, there will be impacts on the workforce, hopefully not all at once, uh, because as we've said, there is more cases now than we tell you about because a lot of those aren't reported. Uh, a lot of those uh, aren't even tested. People are having uh, mild symptoms and uh, getting by just fine, even though we don't know the numbers. So a big number doesn't mean a big number of people who are very seriously ill and that have major impacts either. And Dr. Bell is going to make a comment as well. I just want to, while she's coming up to the podium, thank her for uh, her supportive comments today, uh, especially in light of her uh, call schedule. I just want to add for the pediatric hospitalizations that what we're seeing is even a higher percentage of truly incidental um, COVID cases. And the New York data, data that Governor Scott just referenced, um, that's statewide. I think in New York City, it's even higher. I think about 50% um, are the hospitals felt like were truly incidental. And that may be reflective of a more vaccinated population or a younger population. So. We expect that as children come to the hospital for their regular care, um, e either scheduled or unexpected, that many will test positive when they come in. And so we're prepared with the extra isolation requirements um, that we need for these patients. We also expect that there will be children who come in because of COVID. Um, so I, I, right now we feel really prepared for all of that. And a question for Secretary French, if I may, on the shift in school testing. One of the concerns from the NEA was that staff wouldn't have as much access to testing, um, that you know, staff want to be able to be tested, they want you know, regular access to that. So will they still be able to access tests when they want to, or will it be harder for them to get the rapid test that the students get? Yeah, we've heard that concern, and um, you know, a lot of what we've been working on, and uh, Secretary Sandelson and her team in particular, is on supply. You know, a lot of a lot of the decision making is predicated on supply. So, um, again, we we anticipated making this move in the broader context of deploying more antigen tests in society as a whole. As we said, the initiative with Amazon, I think, is part of that. Uh, but we are aware of that concern, and I think right now we're uh, we've got some modeling in terms of supply that. Uh, I think staff will, will find uh, tests readily available at school, uh, but the supply is something we're going to be monitoring very closely, and that's we'll see how this evolves. Okay. Thank you. Do we know how many antigen tests will be deployed this week to schools? Uh, Secretary Samuelson, do you want to, how many are going out this week? Uh, we're still working on that number. It depends on, it depends on how many are ordered by the schools themselves. We will move to the phones now. And just to note, we have a hard stop at 2 o'clock, and we have a longer than usual remote queue today. So asking folks to try to limit to one or two. And if we have time at the end for follow-ups, just shoot me a text, and we can come back around to you. Or, of course, we can get you the answers offline afterward. So we'll start with Lisa Rathke, Associated Press. Uh, thanks. I, I just had a quick question about the um, the results, the delay in the test results. 
And was that a, a, a technical glitch in, in terms of the state system, or was that something with the lab? I wasn't clear on that. Yeah, from what I understand, it, it may have been a little bit of a combination, although more so on the IT side. Uh, Secretary Quinn is on the line. Uh, maybe he could explain that from the IT sector. Sure, thanks for the question. Yeah, it was a uh, state system um, where we collect results in the database. Uh, we had a collision of information that caused the database to stop, res stop responding. Is that because of so many results or? Um, it was more of a, a timing issue around uh, two different uh, processes trying to gr grab the same file at the same exact time. We put a process in place to uh, notify us immediately if it happens again to ensure that uh, we don't delay results. Okay. And then just one quick question about the contract tracing outside of schools just for the general public. I know people are supposed to notify with their closed contacts. Um, it says on the health department website that uh, the health department is doing contact tracing for people at higher risk. Um, and I'm just wondering, how's that, how is that going? How, how are you knowing who's at a higher risk and how to know, notify them? Uh, I might refer to Dr. Kelso if she's on the line. Yes, I'm happy to take that one. Um, we have information on lab reports that come in that indicate uh, someone's age and um, race and ethnicity and some other limited information. And we're able to use that information to prioritize which cases we're reaching out to. Okay, so you're talking about the people who have actually been tested and are at high risk, not reaching out to people who have not been notified yet, who have not been tested. That's correct. We, we can okay. only reach out to people for whom we have a positive result. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy. All right, we'll move to Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I, I want to start with uh, two weeks ago, uh, Secretary Smith said uh, before his retirement, he would uh, follow up on the status of an uh, internal investigation on uh, DCS uh, looking into uh, a, a teacher from Georgia, Vermont, who was uh, arrested for sexually assaulting a, a student. Um, it, it appears that he was quite busy preparing for his retirement, and uh, that probably fell through the cracks. So I'm, I'm hoping I can uh, get an answer on that. Uh, if not on the line here, uh, maybe off the line in the next uh, day or two. Um, I'll, wait, let me ask I, Secretary I, Samuelson if she has any answer ongoing. to that. I'm sorry? Sure. It's ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Greg Lamoureux, the The investigation is currently still ongoing, um, and so we can provide you with information as, as it becomes available. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. It, it seems like it's uh, been, what, about 45 days, so I uh, just thought we might hear something. Uh, but moving on, Governor, with the drastic change in, uh, in the way schools are now not going to be contact tracing, um, it, it kind of seems like such a drastic change coupled with a drastic increase in cases is an indicator that that your administration was at, at least caught off guard, if not kind of caught with the pants down. So I'm, I'm wondering, at what point did your administration start talking about not contact tracing and, and how far that goes back? Or, or was this a very, very quick response to what you were seeing? Yeah, I, I might... Uh... I may question the characteristic of drastic and uh, and also getting uh, being surprised by this. Um, you know, nothing about uh, this uh, pandemic 
has been textbook. Um, for for instance, we we have been nimble and reacting to what we're seeing on the ground, relying on the data and the science throughout the last almost two years now. Um, we did the same with this Omicron. Um, many uh, were, we didn't have any information on this and how quickly it transmitted uh, the incubation period and so forth and so on, nor did we uh, understand how mild it was until it got here. Um, so uh, we, uh, again, uh, as we've done throughout the pandemic, we made decisions based on the data, based on what we're seeing, based on trying to make things work better, more efficiently, um, not to um, burden the, uh, the schools, uh, nurses in particular, uh, with being contact tracers. Uh, this was a much more logical approach and, uh, and actually will save uh, the, um, uh, the workload uh, on some of, the, uh, of those in the schools uh, to, and provide for a more effective process so that we put more tests out and we get, uh, we get it contained better in a faster way. What we were doing before just wasn't making any sense uh, with this new variant, which hit us uh, very quickly, hit the whole uh, world, uh, country and world, uh, very quickly. Dr. Levine, Dr. Bell, Dr. Secretary French first. Okay. Yeah, hi, Greg. Yeah, I would, I would agree that I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the characterization. And, um, you know, I'd point out from an operational standpoint, we've been uh, looking at um, the viability of contact tracing for some time going back to October. I can remember when I was talking about testing and contact tracing sort of being competing resources. Uh, but certainly, as the governor mentioned, uh, as we've, we've come to realize the impact of Omicron and evaluating those processes relative to the speed of Omicron, uh, that, that compels us to take, take action. Uh, the other point I'd, I would just point out, um, which really makes me take issue with some of your characterization, is that this is happening everywhere in the world right now. You know, it's, it's happening in Europe, it's happening uh, in Asia, it's certainly happening across our country, and I think schools and managing schools in the face of Omicron is, is often referred to in the media as being one of the most challenging public health challenges at the moment. So um, I, don't, I don't agree with your characterization as Vermont uh, being slow to this or not being quick enough. Um, you know, we're working our best way through it as we have with all other challenges in the pandemic, and we've been very successful, I would say, in, in all those pivots that we've had to navigate. I know Dr. Kelso has something to add as well. Thank you. Just to back up what the governor said about us continually watching the data and making decisions based on the data, we at the health department participated in a publication with CDC evaluating contact tracing effectiveness um, many months ago. We've recently re-looked at some of that data um, in the context of the Delta surge to see, again, is contact tracing effective and timely? Um, and is it the best tool? And given our close look at the data and given that Omicron spreads so much more quickly and has a shorter incubation period, you know, this has been based on the science every step of the way. Dr. Bell. Okay. Uh, Hold on. I just wanted to add from the pediatric, pediatric ID standpoint, this is something that we've been talking about in our circles actually since school opened in the fall. Um, and really um, what was the level, of, the type of contact tracing that was being done in schools during the fall during Delta was actually really, really hard. Um, and so this, this was a, an ongoing plan and recommendation that we had from our standpoint. And um, there, was, there was also this recommendation to stop contact tracing once you got to a certain vaccination standpoint, so some schools had, had reached there. There was also changes that we made in the fall really looking at what do we even consider to be a close contact based on what other states were doing and what other studies were showing. And so that has been modified as well. So there's been a lot of modifications to how we think about a close contact. And really with Delta, there was a lot of contact that was happening, certainly with Omicron. I think we should all sort of assume that we're a close contact all the time. And then just a last reminder that there's a lot of focus on schools and close contact and contact tracing in schools, but not elsewhere. And so um, 
every, we should all assume that everywhere we go throughout the community that we have a potential exposure and that we are a potential close contact and sort of behave and act accordingly. Okay, thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. All right, we'll try Lisa Loomis, the value reporter. Good afternoon. It sounds like families associated with a school community will have access to antigen tests and potentially lamp tests. What about people with no ties to a school? I heard someone in the room ask a question, but it wasn't completely audible, and she asked about whether antigen tests and lab tests would be available at testing sites for the general public. Will such tests be available to the general public who do not have a school association? Well, the antigen tests, uh, the NAIH uh, test program that I just uh, announced uh, that's going to be open tomorrow uh, is for the general public. Uh, you can order those online up to uh, uh, two kits uh, per household and uh, we have only have a finite number of them uh, 250,000 kits uh, so this is the start I mean we have other programs and we're pulling every lever we can and as well the uh, President Biden has announced that there will be uh, a test uh, being available uh, to be sent directly uh, to to Vermonters or to um, Households throughout the country uh, in the uh, in the coming weeks. So we have other uh, programs and initiatives we're working on, and uh, in hopes that we'll be building up that supply so that people can have access uh, to those tests, which you think is uh, essential as we get through this this surge. So absent the NIH Amazon program, which opens tomorrow, people without a tie to the school can't necessarily get take-home tests for themselves. Is that correct? Until more tests are available. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? It seems like people in schools or in a school community have a distinct advantage over those who are not in a school community. Yeah, I mean, I just want to remind everyone, but I might ask uh, Secretary Samuelson to to weigh in because we, we do have tests, a uh, number of tests coming in and that we are going to be uh, distributing those in the uh, the coming weeks when they are coming in, but don't um, don't give up on your pharmacists either. Uh, they continue to get tests in test kits in, uh, and I know that they're uh, in uh, a short uh, supply, uh, but they are building their stock, and so that they're going to be available on a um, first come first serve basis in uh, some of those pharmacies. Secretary Samuelson. As the governor mentioned, the availability for the general public is primarily through pharmacies, or you can order online um, at this point in time. Vermont is subject to the same um, supply chain issues that we're experiencing nationally. Um, we are continuing to diversify the test platforms that are coming into the state, and we'll keep you informed as those open up and more opportunities exist. Um, but right now, the best options are through the NIH program, um, ordering online, or going to your local pharmacist. Thank you for that. And then I want to follow up, if I may, with something Senator Scott mentioned two weeks ago. And you were asked a question about whether the state would be providing high quality KN95 or N94 masks to the public. And I heard someone mention today that there may be masks distributed in daycare centers. Is there any update on that? Yeah, I may refer uh, to, let's see. Sherling. Yeah, Commissioner Sherling, or yeah, Commissioner Sherling. Good afternoon. Uh, if you could repeat the question, that would be helpful. Um, will there be um, high quality KN95 and 94 masks made available to the public in Vermont? I believe I heard earlier in the press conference a reference made to such masks being distributed to daycares. Yeah, great question. We are working on a mask distribution sort of enhancement to what has happened in the past. That does include uh, masks beyond uh, cloth masks and procedure and surgical masks, which have been distributed previously. 
Uh, at the moment, that is focused on uh, some areas of, of higher need, but we do anticipate that there may be maps of that type available at various locations like testing sites, uh, vaccination sites, and human services field offices. And that's in the coming weeks? That's correct. Uh, the emergency Great. management team has been working on that uh, over the last couple of weeks. Great. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi. Yeah, I'm just wondering if the state is confident that there will be enough of these rapid tests for everyone who wants them through the school programs? Um, we are confident over the, the coming weeks uh, that we have enough. Um, and we've, uh, we've been managing our supply and, and we think we have enough. Um, but we continue to work every single day to acquire more tests uh, so that because we don't know the duration of this and, and how long um, we'll need uh, the the number of tests that are needed today. So we're doing the best we can with the uh, the supply we have and have coming in, and, uh, and we are uh, acquiring uh, a number a number of tests uh, from different um, vendors, uh, different uh, programs, uh, to to make sure that we have what we need for the schools in particular and for the long-term care facilities. And do we have a rough ballpark of what that? So if we're thinking over the next few weeks, how many? we have set aside right now. Do you have any idea? I mean, I'm sure that's a moving target, but. Um. Yeah, I mean, we have some in route as well. So I, I don't have that number. Uh, we've, we've talked about that uh, a number of times, making sure that we have enough uh, to get through uh, the next, uh, next uh, few weeks. But do you have anything to add to that? Okay, that's just all I can tell you at this point. We'll. We'll try and update you uh, when we uh, see more hitting the ground, um, but um, but we feel um, confident that we have enough to get them through the next few weeks. Great, thank you. And then just one other question about the um, N95 masks. It sounds like Commissioner Schelling was talking about um, some initiatives to get them out to the public. I know some people in schools have been clamoring for um, better access to those. I'm wondering if, how schools might rank on that priority list um, sounds like some are being sent to child care centers. Are, are any being sent to schools as well? Yeah. Commissioner Sherling. Thanks, Governor. I would actually defer the school mask uh, question to Secretary French as he's got that uh, level of detail. Um, Secretary French. Stage. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so far, we haven't seen uh, that request coming in at the state level to the Agency of Education. Um, my impression is that districts are largely uh, taking care of PPE kind of requests at the local level. Um, you know, they, they have 90% of the federal relief dollars, and PPE is certainly an acceptable use of those dollars. Uh, so we think those issues are being addressed at the local level. So if they're if that doesn't remain true, then we'll certainly uh, do our part to step in. But a combination of the funding being available, and I think there's ready access to the supply, um, my impression is that it's being addressed at the local level right now. Thanks. And if I may, it's uh, Mike Sterling again. Just a, a couple of, of notes that uh, our mass distribution will be in part things like KN95, but also a, a large swath of sort of procedure and surgical masks that will help people enhance the layers that they can make with their masking. But uh, equally important of note is that we have not heard or seen any uh, shortages at this point in the supply chain. So folks do have uh, sort of wide availability for N95, CAN95, and other masks, um, both online, uh, local hardware stores. Um, they're sort of ubiquitously available. So uh, in the event that one of our, our distribution uh, sites, once they're up or a, a distance away, it may be just as easy to go to the corner uh, hardware store. All right, we'll move to Aaron Patanko, VT Digger. Hi, uh, first of all, a, a hopefully quick question. Um, just how many people are hospitalized today for COVID-19 and is that the record number? I believe it's 91, but uh, but it is not a record. 
Have we hit the record for one-day hospitalizations or only for the seven-day average? Well, we must have hit it at some point. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be a record. Uh, Commissioner Pichet? Yeah, thank you, Governor. So uh, yesterday, uh, so today we had 91, as the Governor said. Yesterday we had 101. Uh, so 101 uh, back down to 91. I think the day before the 101, it was in the low 90s as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, just kind of wanted that point of clarification. And um, I also have a question about the um, school data, the, the um, kind of the least uh, data through the Department of Health. Um, what is going to change about how you guys collect that data because of the switch to antigen testing? Secretary French. Yeah, Aaron, as we've, I think we flagged earlier that uh, that data is likely to change. Uh, right now, um, you know, we've released sort of the core of what we're planning to do in terms of policy, and we have a lot of work to do to refine um, our related guidance documents and so forth. but. Uh, I would expect, uh, you know, schools, I would say, um, aren't going to be necessarily the administrators of that testing information like they were before that uh, will we'll lose control of that data uh, in exchange for having more broadly uh, distributed the tests in the public. So that's going to be the trade-off. But we haven't finalized our approach yet to the reporting. And do you, do you still have no plans to um, collect any data on closures or the number of schools that were forced to go to remote because of COVID issues? Actually, we are going to stand up a collection that went out this morning for school closures. Um, if you heard my piece on the waiver, of going remote doesn't necessarily count towards being schools being open, but we, we have identified a need, particularly in the Omicron surge, to have a better uh, understanding of school closures. So we're commissioning a, a simple form for schools to submit that data to us this morning. Why don't remote days count for for kind of the waiver process. I mean, it's still better than forcing the school to close entirely, right? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, there's the, the problem is we don't have a standard, a definition of quality of what remote learning looks like. Um, and as we saw last year, that varied considerably around the state. Um, you know, you can imagine remote learning, if you're a high school student taking chemistry, it might look totally different than an elementary student in first grade. Uh, so, you know, part of it is we don't have a good definition. Um, but our other interest is, as I think everyone's learned around the world and around the country, is that it's an inferior approach to learning. And um, as much as we're concerned with the immediate uh, situation with Omicron, I think we're equally concerned with the cumulative effects of students being out of school as a result of COVID. And that, that accumulative effect is really uh, weighing heavily, I think, on our policy, and we want to make sure that we keep kids in school as best we can. Okay, thank you. Lexi, BPR. Um, oh, can you not hear me? We can. Okay. I just wanted to follow up and clarify, do we know what percentage of schools or districts have had to close because of staffing shortages or positive COVID cases since coming back from winter break? Secretary French. Uh, no, I don't have a percent or a number for you. It's been a pretty dynamic situation. Um, I do think, as I think you highlighted, staffing issues are really going to become the prominent uh, cause of school closures here in the coming week. Um, and we're starting to see that play out, uh, certainly as Omicron uh, makes a bigger impact on schools. But we don't have a quantifiable number at this point. Okay, thank you. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Hello, Governor. December 62 COVID deaths are broken down into three categories. Not fully vaccinated, fully vaccinated but not boosted, fully vaccinated and boosted. But there's no listing of deaths of unvaccinated Vermonters. And can you provide this? And if not, why not? Commissioner Pichet. So thanks for the question, Guy. So I don't have it by December, but I do have it for the last six weeks. That's sort of the time frame that we've been looking at. Um, so during the last six-week time period, we had 39 in total 
deaths among those not fully vaccinated, 26 among those uh, fully vaccinated but not boosted, and then four among those fully vaccinated and boosted uh, by our um, calculations. So again, 39 um, for those not fully vaccinated, 26 for those fully vaccinated but not boosted, and then four uh, deaths among those fully vaccinated and boosted. So again, when we come up with those uh, percentages at this point, about 250,000 Vermonters are fully vaccinated and boosted. Um, you know, there's probably somewhere around uh, 200,000 Vermonters who are fully vaccinated but not boosted, and then a much smaller number of those that are, um, you know, not uh, fully vaccinated yet. So that's sort of the breakdown uh, in terms of the last six weeks. Well, uh, Commissioner, I guess what I'm looking for is the number of unvaccinated Vermonters who uh, have died over the last six weeks. Yeah, no, it's a, you know, so, so no, you're saying no vaccine at all. I'm sorry? No, no vaccine doses at all. So when, that, when that's what I'm looking for. Yes. Right. Remember who have died, who have had no vaccine doses at all. So, you know, the, again, the way we look at it is, is those three categories. We'll, we'll take a look at, at whether we can parse that out even more. Um, you know, obviously, a, a shot of the vaccine provides some protection rather than, than no shots of the vaccine. But still, as we've seen throughout the, the pandemic and even more recently in Delta, um, not just fully vaccinated, but boosted is really what you need to be fully protected. So um, having a single dose or having no doses, you know, um, there is a difference. But uh, at this point, it's, you know, it's not uh, anywhere near the difference between being fully vaccinated and being boosted on top of that. But we'll see if we can break that down more. That would be very helpful. Thank you. And, and, uh, while, and, Scott, and this is Dr. Oh, Levine. While, while I can't give you the exact numbers, we know throughout the pandemic that the number of people who only got one dose and were still waiting for a second dose were in the single digit percents, a very small number generally. And that number shrinks over time. So I would anticipate most of the people in the not fully vaccinated category are truly unvaccinated. And even if a small percentage of them don't fit that um, profile, most of them are going to fit that profile. And if you think about it as a rate, because the number of unvaccinated in the state is the smallest number uh, out of 600 plus thousand people, um, the rate of death in that group is much, much higher, which was illustrated on the slide with the 24 times the risk of death. I guess it would help if there were actual numbers of unvaccinated, so we could we could make that judgment. We'll, we'll take a look. I, I'm not sure if we can get that or not, but when I see, I see the deaths, I, I see a numerous, uh, but, numerous uh, folks that are not vaccinated. Governor Scott, uh, on a separate matter, uh, are you a commissioner, Sherlin, concerned that the qualified immunity legislation becomes law? Significant numbers of Vermont police that retire or take jobs in other states that do not pose that legal threat to their livelihood? Yeah. Um, I know Commissioner Sherling is concerned. I'll let him answer. Thanks, Governor. Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, uh, we are gravely concerned uh, about the impact of that potential legislation or working with a variety of partners and stakeholders to uh, craft a, a cogent and comprehensive uh, assessment to the legislature of the potential impacts and downsides of proceeding in that fashion. We are, of course, uh, very much supportive of ongoing modernization of law enforcement operations, and we think there's a variety of things that have been done recently um, that are potentially impactful that we need to see how things uh, play out with those initiatives. And uh, meanwhile, we've got other initiatives that are in motion as well. So uh, we're not opposed uh, because we are uh, averse to change and modernization. I uh, just don't think this is the right way to go. Thank you. Cam Davis, the Vermont Journal. Thank you. I have two questions. First, Dr. Levine, I'd like to ask Dr. Levine whether he has a thought about the whole population of the Vermont 
But one of the things I'm concerned about is the older population, say from 70 to 100. Uh, the Omicron variant is supposed to be much less uh, virulent and much less damaging to most people. But I'd like to know from Dr. Levine what his feeling is about whether there is the, uh, the extent to which the Omicron is more dangerous to the older, um, is, it, is it significantly more dangerous to older people? That's a great question. And that's something that, you know, it's been in the state for a few weeks. So it's going to be hard for me to give you the full assessment, even around the world assessment, never mind uh, the question you're asking. But I think we should make the assumption that um, any variant of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in a person who has either age or other underlying medical conditions as their reason for being at higher risk would still be at higher risk. The one thing we're finding in a um, more research setting is that it does not seem to be as impactful on the lung tissue itself, more on the upper airways and, uh, and the, the, the bronchi as well, but not on the actual parenchyma of the lung, which is really um, says a lot because all the previous variants and certainly Delta uh, cause significant amounts of uh, pneumonia in the higher risk group, which then leads to a lot of the other complications that make that group not fair as well. Uh, so we'll have to we'll have to see uh, over time. We you know we 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 know we see deaths two to three weeks down the road from when people become a case, if not longer. And so many of the deaths that we've been seeing most recently. I would guess would be Delta variant deaths and not Omicron. Um, so that's about the best I can do for you right now. Thank, thank you for that. I understand that there's, there's no hard data yet, but I was, I, was, I was interested in your sense as a physician about what that was like. I know it's a likely question. My next question, in the light of that, is my next question is for the governor. Um, and I brought this up once before, and I'd like to ask you again, given the question, given the likelihood that um, uh, the 70 to 100 cohort is much more at risk. Um, if you look at the, if you look at the actual data, I think this data is correct. That the first wave, um, that the first wave um, of, of deaths was in uh, was in May of 2020, very low, 18. But then it went in the second wave, which was um, February of 21, it went to 42. But the, the uh, weight in, uh, in yeah, I'm not sure if Mike Pichak would confirm this exactly, but uh, the weight in, in December, last December, um, a month ago, was 50. So that in other words, the death rate uh, has been going up steadily, leaving us, and that, that gets aside from who's really got it, whether it's comorbidity, et cetera, if you're dead, you're dead. And so my question is, given that the actual rate of death are higher now than they have ever been before, whether you consider that, whether you reconsider your feeling that we don't need any vaccine mandate. I still think it's a, a personal choice. Um, obviously, I truly believe vaccinations are the answer. And something that I was struck with in the Delta, I'll use the, the Delta wave, uh, and that's where we saw the most deaths, uh, was the younger age of the deaths. Um, that's something that I was struck with almost on a daily basis when I'd see the, um, the results, the, the deaths, and uh, some of the information surrounding the deaths. But, the age bothered me uh, uh, immensely. Uh, any death is tragic, but when you see them in the in the 40s and 50s unvaccinated, um, that uh, really made me pause. Uh, but again, you know, our, we're at at this point in time, um, we um, we want to leave it uh, to to people to make the right decisions. Uh, thankfully, Vermonters, for the large part, have made the right decisions. I think following through is really important. And if there's one thing that we can 
if I could get across uh, to people is if you have the opportunity uh, to get up to date, uh, as uh, Dr. Levine might say, what's what's your term? Um, up to, up to date, protected. fully protected, up to date. Uh, do so. I mean, the boosters have been very, very effective in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. And uh, so, if you can get uh, fully protected, it's not too late. Um, and you can, and and there's a wide range uh, now of uh, people who can uh, be protected by vaccines. So, uh, we've come a long ways, uh, but uh, but we can't we can't give up now, and we can't let our guard down uh, because while we hope this last, this next, uh, the Omicron is the last variant to come along, the reality is it isn't. Uh, there will be other variants, but if it uh, affects a, a large proportion of the, uh, the country and the world, it may uh, stem the tide a little bit and, uh, and maybe we'll be able to move into that endemic stage. But, but again, get vaccinated, get fully vaccinated, get up to date uh, with your vaccinations. And if you haven't been vaccinated yet, it's not too late to start. But the people that can't, that are not, the, that are victims here, are not the people, that, old people that didn't get vaccinated. What they are is that old people are much more likely to be infected and possibly killed by people who aren't vaccinated and who aren't interested in it, not interested in it at all. So it's, if somebody is over 70 and is not vaccinated fully, that, that just means that they're not very interested. But the, the fact is that if every single one of them was, a lot of them would die because 30 year olds or 20 year olds or 18 year olds won't do it. And I don't think that there's any way uh, that that's the, that, any, that the only thing that I can see that gov state government could do in order to protect all people, 40 or 50,000 Vermonters, okay, is to force people to get this other people to get vaccinated. Not a personal choice for people who are old. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Ham, you, you make a great point, but if you look at um, the vaccination rates across the country uh, and uh, the amount of the political nature, uh, the overtones of the, the pandemic uh, and being so polarizing in some respects. If we weren't, if we didn't do this as a country uh, and, and, and our borders are open, we, we, we welcome people in uh, to visit our beautiful state. Uh, I'm not sure that that would protect everyone at that point. Um, we still would have that issue uh, because we're very mobile uh, throughout the country. Your deaths, your deaths in uh, December of, the, of last year, okay, are the highest that we've ever had in Vermont for any for any phase of the pandemic. Highest. And they and, and I just don't, you said uh, last time we talked about I know I'm sorry I'm arguing on it, but the last time we talked about it, you said you said it was not your style, and that you preferred the carrot to stick. But for people over seventy. They, there are no carrots. There isn't a carrot in sight. <laughs> well, I, again, I think our approach has worked, Ham, in some respects. And while we have, I'm not sure that having a uh, vaccine mandate uh, would have prevented all the deaths either. Uh, I think that uh, it's, uh, we have those, it's, it's effective, but it's not 100% effective. So. There are going to be breakthrough cases, uh, regardless of how many people uh, get vaccinated. So, it's just the reality uh, of the the pandemic, the virus, and the nature of the virus. So, again, we'll have to uh, um, move on, and uh, and I'm sure that we'll have this debate on a different day. Thank you, Joseph Dresser, the Barton Chronicle. All right, we'll move to Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, you know, I was wondering, given that the um, immunizations for the childhood diseases, MMR and chickenpox is over 90%, I was wondering what Dr. Bell and Dr. Levine are hearing back from people who are, you know, just do the math, are getting their kids vaccinated but are not themselves getting vaccinated um, for COVID. 
I think it's the other way around as well. It, it seems as though a number of parents and adults that are vaccinated that aren't getting their kids. I mean, that's based on what we're seeing with the, uh, the percentages. That's probably typically the case, but Dr. Bell. Yeah, that's a great question and you're correct that we have a great vaccination rate in Vermont for childhood immunizations, um, which means that there are, are definitely parents who are vaccinating their children with other vaccines um, and still have not yet for the, um, for the COVID vaccine. So it really varies when we talk to families, it's sort of all over the place in terms of for those families. So of course there are the families that don't vaccinate at all. Um, it's a very small portion of the population. Um, but then for this, this portion that you know we're really interested in are the parents, oftentimes they've been vaccinated themselves. They get their children vaccinated with, with their childhood immunizations, but they're still hesitant on um, the COVID vaccine. And I think part of that is um, it still, for some, it still feels new. Um, one thing that I have found to be helpful is just talking about the millions and millions of children across the country who have received this vaccine. Um, and every, you know, every week we add to that. And I think that comfort in numbers can be really helpful. And so there are parents now who are listening, who have have been vaccinated themselves, they haven't vaccinated their child yet, um, and they will start to feel more comfortable just seeing those numbers. Um, there's a lot of just fear and anxiety of the unknown um, and the relatively low risk of severe disease in children. And so, um, so some people are waiting, but I'm hopeful that more and more um, parents will vaccinate their children. I, I do remind folks of especially in this age group, there is a, a very, very rare um, entity that can happen after COVID infection called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And that happens a few weeks after COVID infection, and that can be really serious. Um, so that's, it's definitely worth protecting children against that. Even if they have a mild COVID infection, they're still at risk for, for MIS-C. And um, this is where having good conversations with your child's health care provider. Um, these are folks that really want to have individual conversations, and that's what we're doing in our pediatric practices and our family medicine practices is really giving a personal recommendation. We recommend every child in Vermont who's eligible to get vaccinated, we recommend that they do so. Um, for <clears throat> Commissioner Pichek, I was wondering with the self-reporting, you know, human nature being what it is, um, the self-reporting is not going to be as reliable as far as total case counts is concerned, you know, with the rapid antigen test. Should we, we've been looking more at hospitalizations and ICU stays and deaths versus just total case counts going forward? Yes, I, I do think, Tim, you need to look at all the data, you know, together at this point. You know, on the case counts, you know, I mentioned that four to five times number. Uh, so that was being, that's attributable to the fact that there are milder cases that people might think are cold or they might have no symptoms at all. So there are more, um, you know, more cases out there because of that. Under Delta and previous variants, we were uh, estimating that was closer to two or 2.4 in terms of that difference. So there's that, then there's the antigen test piece, you know, as well. Obviously we want people to report those. You know, when you look at our PCR testing, it is back up over 10,000 per day. So that's what we were averaging, you know, prior to the holidays and, um, you know, before at-home tests were as widely available. So there is still good insight there on the case data. Uh, but of course, you know, we want to look at all of the data in total to sort of get a full picture of what's going on. So we, we, do you think you'd be doing just some statistical analysis going forward, like you were mentioning the, the, the multiplier effect? Yeah, we've been doing that throughout the pandemic, you know, trying to, you know, it's the difference between the, the infection rate and the reported rate. So what's the implied infection rate and what's the case reported rate? So we've been doing that, you know, throughout and we'll continue to do that. Certainly it might become even more critical as we move forward. All right, great. Thank you. All right, we have five to go, but we're a little bit over time. So I'm going to ask that we try to get through these as fast as possible. And any it's like a lightning round, <laughs> have a yes or no answer. Okay. <laughs> Any follow-ups you can direct to me and I can make sure we get you the answers. Uh, Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express.
Thank you, Ed. Lisa, Waterbury Roundabout. Good afternoon. Thanks, Jason. Hello, Governor. Um, I'll be quick. Um, just trying to hop off what Dr. Bill said. It sounds like to sum up the best chance that we have for kids to have a somewhat normal next few months of school moving ahead are good math, lots of tests, and vaccines. Um, it sounds like uh, Secretary French covered the math question and is, you're doing your best with getting as many tests as possible. So I'm wondering if now that we have kids from kindergarten through 12th grade that can get vaccines and from 12 and up as of last week that can get boosted, What's the likelihood that we might see a better push coming forward now, maybe from the National Guard or others to try to get more vaccine clinics out there to get um, as many kids vaccinated and boosted as possible, um, given what um, Dr. Levine keeps saying about boosters being really important? Yeah, obviously uh, we want to make sure uh, we have the vaccines available uh, for people who want them. And I think we've done that thus far. It isn't as though uh, the vaccine clinics have been overrun. Uh, but there has been an uptick uh, anecdotally over the last uh, week or so. Um, so that's a good sign. But we will continue uh, to add uh, resources uh, to get vaccines uh, to those who want them. Um, but, but at this point in time, I'm not seeing that we have a, a problem with the vaccination clinics or the number of them, unless Dr. Levine or Secretary Samuelson has any other information. Now the, the only addition is, you know, there are abundant school clinics over the, this month and next month. Um, a school near you will have one. And that's a great, easy place for a K through 12 person to access vaccine. Um, then they're not being overrun. So won't be long waiting and, lines or anything. And Dr. Levine, um, family members could also get vaccines at those clinics as well, yes. right? It's not just students? Yes, they're meant to be uh, for the community, uh, but conveniently located at the school. Okay, thank you very much. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Tom Davis. All right, we'll move to Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Thank you, uh, lightning rounds going fast. Uh, I guess while Dr. Bell is uh, available, I'll ask uh, questions to her. Spoke earlier about children too young to get vaccinated. Um, can you give us a bit more about how COVID presents itself in these young kids, the uh, potential prevalence of long COVID, and how worried should families be? Uh, you know, should they accept that infection is inevitable, or should they be moving heaven and earth to try to avoid, um, you know, like a two-year-old getting it? Yeah, great question. Um, so it's really presenting a lot like other respiratory viral infections. Um, and I can start with infants. What we see um, or what we see when, when infants get other viral infections in terms of just kind of feeling unwell, sometimes they get a fever, they're not drinking well, they might need to come to the hospital for IV fluids and also to monitor to make sure they're, they don't have another type of infection like a serious bacterial infection. So that might be one um, reason why an infant might get admitted with COVID. Um, another, once you get to the toddler age, you, you know, we are seeing more, as Dr. Levine mentioned, upper airway um, effects rather than lower airway. So with viruses like respiratory syncytial virus, those affect the lower airways and cause really, really severe disease in infants and, and, and medically complex children. Um, we haven't seen that COVID can cause that. We haven't really seen that in Vermont. The, you know, the lower airway, like the pneumonia, the bronchiolitis, we haven't seen that at this point. Um, and, and so that's generally what, the, the combo of that is generally what we're seeing. We also see some vomiting um, and some dehydration as well. And really it can look, when people say COVID can look like anything, it really can in children. It just is, is, is runs the gamut here. I would say to families that um, to think about, really to think about what you would do with your family as a precaution heading into a, a respiratory viral, viral season. So we're heading into RSV season, flu season, what would you normally do in those circumstances? And that depends on the health condition of your child. It, that would um, depend on the age of your child as, you know, if you had an infant. 
I don't think that families, um, again, I, I don't, I'm not telling families they need to pull their kids out of childcare at all. I think if you're the type of family that, um, that has to do that anyway to avoid flu and RSV, then, that, then in that case, yes. But otherwise, I, I think really just getting ready for a lot of disruption. I think that's really the biggest thing. There's a ton of disruption right now because children are getting sick, parents are getting sick, childcare providers um, there's, are already strained and stressed. So for those families I re of this age group, I really think be prepared for a lot of disruption and it's very, very hard. There's a lot of missed work. There's a lot of scrambling to figure out childcare. And I think that's really the big struggle for families in this age group right now. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, not a question, but a quick comment for Secretary French. Uh, during this conference, was messaged by a public school staff member that's looking for uh, clarification on um, how testing kits will be available to staff members. Um, they were concerned about using testing to help protect vulnerable family members. Yeah, I think I heard your question. A staff member who's concerned or wants to know more information about access to kits at school? Yeah, they'd just be looking for more information as soon as it becomes available. Yeah, well, we'll have that out. As I mentioned, uh, we had to announce the sort of the core direction of where we're going, but we have a lot of work to do to, to, to roll out the specific guidance documents, and we're working very hard on that right now. So I would just encourage that person to stay tuned, and uh, we'll have that information out shortly. Thank you all. Mike, True North reports. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Uh, hi, thanks for taking my call. Mike Belowski with True North reports. Um, I have a question about the VAERS, the uh, Vaccine Adverse Effects Reporting System with the federal uh, government. Uh, the most recent VAERS data from Vermont shows more than 1,800 adverse reactions from COVID including 11 deaths and 30 victims have become disabled. Uh, what are Vermont doctors and the health department doing to report and investigate these cases? And, and that can be for you or, or for um, Dr. Levine. <clears throat> yeah, we've uh, answered this question a number of times, but bottom line is, first, I'll thank Vermonters who actually have put information in the system and Vermont physicians who put information in the system because that's what it's meant to be, an early warning system. Anything that could be even remotely connected to the vaccine uh, goes into the system and then it gets checked out. The Vermont Department of Health nor Vermont clinical community does not investigate every one of those. They report those and they go to the CDC and federal authorities where further investigation is undertaken and looked at in the context of what's being reported by all 50 states and territories. Um, as a big compendium. So um, we're not investigating every single event that a Vermont clinician puts into the system. Okay, and, and uh, thank you. And my next question is um, uh, on a separate but related issue. Uh, New York's governor said Friday that 43% of their state's COVID hospitalizations were actually uh, not for COVID. They were folks who came into their hospitals for different medical emergencies unrelated to COVID. And then I suppose they got tested or, or whatever, and it became a COVID hospitalization. But uh, is it your estimation that about half of Vermont's COVID hospitalizations may also be uh, initially unrelated to COVID as they come in? Yeah, um, I would. And we've heard seen some headlines out of New Jersey, by the way, I might add. I think, but it's Thank you. Yeah, I would not want to give a percentage today based on my uh, guess about that. Um, but the bottom line is we're actually looking into exactly what you're referring to, which is trying to get a better handle on understanding who is admitted because of COVID, who is admitted, and then find, you find out they have COVID because they got a test in the emergency room on the way up to the floor. Um, keep in mind, it's right. not always black and white. Uh, there are many people who are very complex medically. Those are the kind of people that end up in the hospital generally anyways and COVID could be the straw that breaks the camel's back, uh, even though it wasn't mainly their reason for admission. It was decompensation about one of their other medical problems. So it's not always super straightforward, but we're trying to get uh, a glimpse into that in Vermont now. I shouldn't 
think that Vermont would be dramatically different than elsewhere. So numbers are being reported from elsewhere in the country. Uh, we would probably be in line with those. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for your time. Okay. That's it. Thank you all very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again in about two weeks. Thank you.